Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's me, Jackie. I'm very excited. I kind of wanted to say we were talking with our very special guest who we have, and I'll introduce in a moment. We were talking a little bit about- We're in the green room right now. We're in the green, yeah, we're in the green room. We're getting ready to go on. Uh, you know, we're sort of talking about some updated, you know, code words we're going to use and talking about some ancient history, I guess, for all of us. And it was a lot of fun. I really want to start talking about spaceships and video games, computers of the old days, but we're probably not going to talk about all of those because this isn't a podcast about any of those topics. It is instead one about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we talk about a topic related to the field. This week, we're going to be talking about higher order thinking and how to engage higher education students with kind of more robust use of our technology. And to do that, we are bringing in a special guest who has researched this topic extensively, and that's Dr. Darlene Crone Todd. Darlene, thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, thank you, Rob. I appreciate being here with you and Jackie and Diana. I really am honored to be here and excited. Well, I was very happy. I think you were a guest that has been kind of a, a long time in coming in terms of like, let's pick a topic. But we'd been mentioning like, oh, let's get Darlene Crone Todd on the show at some point, because I have been a big fan of some of the kind of shorter pieces you've done in the operants newsletter that comes out every quarter, because you've had such fun topics. Like you wrote an article about like a short like, kind of piece about zombies, about using pop culture in teaching your students, defining gaslighting. There's an operational definition of gaslighting, you know, a term that I feel like has has really been used a lot more in kind of the media these days. And just having someone operationally define what it is and what are the behavioral principles behind it. I was like, this is a person who has so many cool ideas about topics because talking about behavior analysis and talking about anything related to sort of pop culture is a real kind of smaller hobby of mine. So I thought I would have so much just a fun conversation, you know, outside of the topic we have tonight. But I think a lot of that operational definition piece is really going to come into our higher order thinking because there are so many terms that I never thought about how they would be defined behaviorally. And I'm in education. And some of the things we'll be talking about, like Bloom's taxonomy, is that's everywhere in education. I certainly know about scaffolding. Did I ever think about defining it very well? I guess probably not. Not as much as you did in any of your papers. To be fair, Rob, same. And I'm in higher education and I'm always like, they'd be like, have you used Bloom's taxonomy? And then I would just do this. Like that. I usually think of Bloom County, that like comic strip. And I I thought that was it for a while. (laughs) I was like, oh, it's like the thing with the platypus dude. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. But that's not (laughs) not what it is. Incorrect. It's not what it is. (laughs) So, Darlene, before we get into our topic for tonight, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and, and how you got interested in higher order thinking and, and you know defining so many exciting terms? Well, gosh, that's an interesting set of questions, right? So I guess my background is that I was kind of a person who came to higher ed a little bit later in life. I guess it's not that much later, but it felt later, right? I was already in my mid-20s when I started going to university for my undergraduate degree. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to study, actually. I thought I had a good background in math and business, and I thought I might go into accounting or business or something. And then I took intro psych, fell in love with psychology. And then I started taking a course in behavior modification during my second year from Joseph Pear at the University of Manitoba and was introduced to computer-aided PSI at the time. And started doing work in the research lab, actually, on experimental analysis of human behavior, actually on shaping human limb movement and then later chaining. So I just fell in love with the whole area. I did some other research projects for our Northern Studies program on finding out about different types of programs that there were available in Canada to study the Northern communities or to bring education to the Northern communities. And some work with an environmental psychologist as well, how environments shape our behavior or change our behavior. But I really, really, really fell in love with behavior analysis. You know, every time I would come up with a new theory about how it was that our behavior changes or how it evolves over the course of our lifespan, every time I'd come up with that, like, oh, man, nobody saw this. Then I'd read something by Skinner and found out <laughs> he already did it, right? <laughs> So, like, come on, Skinner. Come yeah, on. right. He's way, way ahead of me, right? So I thought that's telling me I'm in the right area. So my undergrad and my master's research was all in experimental analysis of human behavior. And then I started on this road of doing higher order critical thinking as part of my doctoral program. 
and actually, be, well, and I can talk more about this later, but it was based upon my experiences, I think, as an undergrad. And then, like, what, one of those puzzles, like, how come not everybody thinks this way? And, mm-hmm. you know, because I remember standing outside the exam, at, you know, the final exam multi-purpose room where we all had to go for final exams and students saying things like, I don't know how this professor expects me to memorize all of these questions. And I thought, why are you memorizing them? Like, it's clear that the questions kind of go from define and give an example and compare and contrast and argue why. And it's like, if you can do those other things, you can do the easier stuff. So you shouldn't really be memorizing all this. It's like you should be understanding it. <laughs> so that's that's <laughs> a, that's a little teaser I'll give you for when we talk about the research a bit more. Excellent. So we should probably talk about the articles that we'll be discussing. And again, you know, one of the nice things is when we have a special guest on, we sort of have some guiding articles for the listeners, but you are going to have so many more things to talk about that go beyond these articles. But these are our starting points. So for folks who have never thought about, who, maybe they're not working in higher education, or the last time they thought about higher education was when they graduated and ran away from the building, never to think of it again, <laughs> went into a new field, perhaps. We have four articles that we'll be discussing, and they are Crone, Todd, and Pear, and Reed, Operational Definitions for Higher Order Thinking, Objectives at the Secondary Level, the Post-Secondary Level, sorry, from Academic Exchange Quarterly 2000, Crone, Todd, and Pear, Application of Bloom's Taxonomy to PSI, from the Behavior Analyst Today, 2001, Pear, Crone, Todd, Worth, and Simister, from Assessment of Thinking Levels in Students' Answers, from Academic Exchange Quarterly, 2001, and Crone Todd, Assessment of Thinking and Adult Learners from Behavioral Development Bulletin 2007. And Darlene, I think we don't have too many episodes where all the articles we're discussing are by our special guest as an author. So you're in kind of a, a rare category here where you're talking about everything that you wrote as well as some extras too. So it's mm-hmm. always that's always very fun, <laughs> we find. Wow, I feel honored. Thank you. You mentioned, and, and we were discussing a little bit before the show, that you first got interested in the idea of kind of looking at higher order thinking and sort of personalized systems of instruction when you yourself were a student. And that led me to the question of what was personalized systems of instruction, especially computerized ones from beyond? You know, I I think today everyone sort of thinks about, oh, you can do all this stuff online. You know, you learn online, everyone's in an online program. But if you go back maybe, you know, 15 years, you know, maybe even 10 years, it, it feels like one of these technologies that couldn't have existed. But, you know, we know that PSI original work was from well before computers were something that everyone had seven of in their house and you know and in the form of a phone. So could you tell us a little bit about what PSIs were like when you were starting out in higher education, when you were starting to use them as part of your doctoral program? Sure. Well, can I use a Wayback Machine to tell you another little tidbit secret? Of course you can. I so, love Wayback Machine. Right? So if we go way back, to me being in grade one, and I realized this later, that there were reading labs. And reading lab was this self-paced set of, there were these big boxes at the back of our room, Hmm. and you could go through these little reading vignettes. I remember reading about brown bears and (laughs) other things like that. Like that just stuck out to me because I loved reading about them, right? Like what were they? Where did they live? What did they eat? So forth. And Then you would answer these questions, and if you'd have to get them all complete and correct, and then you could go on to the next one. So there was kind of this, it was all mastery-based, and I realized later, this is PSI in like K through 12, right? Like, Mm -hmm. And this is really popular back at the time that I was in grade one. And, you know, as students, we kind of loved this. We could go at our own pace, and we'd get immediate feedback on whether or not we were right, and we could keep going on and on and on on these things. And there's a little bit of competition among us, right? Because mm-hmm. like you could be finished all of this work in your reading and language arts, like whenever it was up to you, you could get it all mm-hmm. done and then go into something else. So that was kind of exciting. Or you could help other students out in the class. So I think that I never thought about it until recently, but I think that when I, when I was introduced to computer-aided PSI, which was taught by Joseph Parrott at the University of Manitoba, that this is probably why I love this system so much, because it is self-paced. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. But the early, early PSI, if you go back to the work of Fred Keller, when he published his seminal article in 1968, right, in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, Goodbye Teacher, 
right, mm-hmm. which is based mm-hmm. upon a rhyme. And he's introducing people to a system that he's developed and he introduced in Brazil as well as the United States. PSI was, you know, these units of study that you could, you know, master hopefully in about a week or so. And you would go in and you would take a test when you were ready to take the test. And then you either passed it or you got a restudy. And if you got a restudy, you could go over the test with the proctor or the professor. And then you could come back and retake it when you're ready to to do so after, you know, some amount of a kind of time out to restudy. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, like think about that as an instructor, right? Like if you have 10 units that you have to have students take tests on, how many different tests do you need for them? You know, if they get a restudy on one, you don't just give them the same test. You have Mm -hmm. to have like a whole bunch of questions and different forms of the exam, right, for each unit. So imagine the administration of that, right? Like, just can you imagine, like, like with 10 students versus 30 students versus 300, what would that be like? A lot of tests. (laughs) A lot of grading. Yeah. (laughs) More, more file cabinets, right? Mm-hmm. Basically, all the file cabinets, right? Yeah, file cabinets. Imagine carrying all the tests to and from the classroom and keeping them organized. Mm-hmm. And you know, and we didn't have, com- and they didn't have computers back then either, right? So when Joe Pear computerized this, he actually made it so that you could go in and you could request a a test online. And this is before point and click. Okay. This is before we had windows, right? Mm -hmm. So we actually had to learn how to type in commands into the computer. And I never think of myself as somebody who programs, but I guess I did, right? I had to learn programming to be able to do this because you had to give the computer commands to get into your account and then to call up a test and then tell it, to add more lines if you wanted to add more information to your answer. (laughs) Are you talking like a DOS prompt or more like an old, like early 80s looking kind of, you know, Unix or mainframe kind of? Mainframe. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Yeah, Rob, it's definitely a mainframe computer, right? And so, so we did that. And, you know, we, after you mastered a test, then you could sign on to be a peer reviewer or proctor Mm -hmm. for a student who had not yet passed that unit. So, I mean, think of it, right? Like if you love this stuff and you're, and you just go in and on a weekly basis, at least on a weekly basis, you pass one unit a week or more, you can be peer reviewing a whole bunch of them. And the peer reviews were great because they were bonus points in the course. (laughs) So, you know, and and the final exam was worth something like 60%. Mm-hmm. Because it was in person, and they, that was the quality control you had over the online course, was making sure that people were who they said they were, and, you know, that they weren't just doing things open book. So, you know, it was nice being able to pad up the, the, the bonus points, just in case. But, mm-hmm. but, but the, here's, here's the trick, right? Like, when you do that, and you're actually going in, you're taking your tests, and you're peer-reviewing other students' tests, you're actually learning. Oh, yeah. That's the best way. Right. Darlene, I took a class like this as well in undergraduate. I didn't know it was a PSI. I was like, this is the weirdest class. It was a learning class. I can't remember who my professor was because I actually never saw him because it was like work at your own pace. There was TAs to like go over my test with me and you earned points to go to a professor lecture, but I actually never went to the lecture. But it was fascinating, right? It didn't work as a reinforcer. <laughs> no, not for me, but I did love the class so much that I looked into, you know, behavior analysis more. But it's just fascinating how it works. But I became that TA the second semester and I learned far more than I did with just going through material. Jackie, did you get to do the programming part? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah. So did you do yours in person or online? How did that work? In person, in a tiny room. <laughs> Okay, so you went in and actually did like paper and pen tests, is that correct? Yeah. Interesting that they didn't have it online by then. Jackie's a lot older than we all think. She's really 67 and you know, it was No. <laughs> are you going to make me Are you going to make me talk about vampires again and behavior analysis? No. <laughs> <laughs> if we got time, I hope so. I mean, like, that was my original. Let's talk about monsters and define them. Being- <laughs> I had just just been regaling Rob with the story of the summer that I spent creating a website for my English professor that I had to use HTML to create because it was a long time ago mm-hmm. about the great vowel shift 
And he wasn't really very impressed. And yet here he is impressed by Dr. Crow and Todd's story about how she... <laughs> well, I never, used, I never used PSI in any of my, you know... I don't think I did either. Uh, in my, you know, higher education. But I was someone who really, really wanted to have a stupid website on the internet. So knowing HTML was a little less... I had I'd done that. It was a little old oh, hat. Oh, I see. I see. A little see. hat oh, for fine. me. But Diana, I am very impressed. I just want you to know that. Well, thank you. I, I think that that's it. amazing. Like, because HTML is not that easy. You know, actually, anything that's systematized and, and in a language, you know, I mean, in some ways, it's easier to use a language like a programming language than learning an actual speaking language. But <laughs> But it's still hard. It's still hard. And that's amazing that you did that. We're all showing our age by the fact that we know what any of this is, I think. <laughs> These are just yeah, stories I, our older siblings told us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, sure I, I read a it. book once. <laughs> Doc? What's, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Everything's a touchscreen for me, thanks. So, Darlene, when we're talking about improving higher educational programming... You know, part of it is, can we set up these PSIs or computer-assisted PSIs, which allows for the students to sort of learn at their own pace? And and if that were it, I I think it would be easy enough to do. You know, anyone could say, well, let me get my vocabulary list, and then here's my next vocabulary list, or here are my comprehension questions, sort of like your 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 brown bear reading unit from from back in the day. But the other piece, and and the piece that you've done so much research on as well, is What should go into these PSIs? And this is where I think it is so fascinating how you went back to something that's been around as long as it has this Bloom's taxonomy and started thinking, okay, how can we make these PSIs? How can we make these units more meaningful for the students? So it's not just like you were saying, the, did you memorize all the terms? No, I couldn't remember all the terms because if that's all you had to do for the average job, well, anyone could do a job or probably do is memorize, you know, 50 terms because that can be hard, but not as challenging as the actual doing a skill. Well, there's no critical thinking. There's no critical thinking. Right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. We should probably take a minute for some of our folks who are our listeners who are not in education or, you know, haven't been in education or in a while. Or have been bluffing their way through this whole time. Or have been nodding through the staff <laughs> meetings where they talk about Bloom's text. And I'm like, mm, yes. No, no. Yeah. Like me. Thanks, Diana, for outing <laughs> me. <laughs> to talk about what Bloom's taxonomy could be. So, Darlene, would you mind giving us our, our elevator pitch for Bloom's taxonomy in, in education and thinking about education and teaching? So, like I said, you know, we had all these questions, and I think in these early PSI courses, they were all written answer questions. And, you know, I'd figured out pretty early on that the textbook with and the questions we had kind of went from something like define reinforcement give an example of reinforcement, you know, positive reinforcement, let's say. Give an original example of positive reinforcement. Give an original example of positive reinforcement and explain why on the basis of the principle of positive reinforcement, it's a correct example. Right? So, mm-hmm. so, and then later you get into things like comparing and tra- contrasting positive and negative reinforcement, right? Or compare and contrast negative reinforcement and punishment. And so just as some examples... So I'd figured out that if you could do this compare and contrast stuff, you know, and justify why it's a particular answer, that that it's correct or not correct, then you should be able to do all of those other things. Like if I can give you an original example and explain why on the basis of the principle of positive reinforcement, it's correct. I have to make point to point correspondence between that principle and my example, right? So you shouldn't then have to memorize what the principle is because you were already able to use it backwards and forwards with that other answer. And you already have examples that you've thought about. Then you can save a lot of time by thinking about these more complex answers, right? So when I would show up to final exams when taking these courses, Students would be complaining about how they have to memorize all these 200 or 300 questions for the final exam. And I thought, why are you memorizing them all? Like, if you understand this stuff and you can do it backwards and forwards, you can answer any of these questions. So when I was finishing up my master's and we started, you know, Dr. Pear and I were having this conversation and, and he said, well, why don't we study this? You know, he mm-hmm. said, I've always thought of, of CAPSI, the computer-aided PSI as being like a laboratory to study textual or verbal behavior on the part of students in the educational process. So then we said, okay, so what are we going to use as something that's like a reliable or valid sort of assessment? Because when you look at critical thinking assessment, 
There's a million different definitions out there. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, let's use Bloom's taxonomy because it's so ubiquitous, right? Just what the three of you have already said, right? Rob and Jackie and Diana, right? Like, Mm -hmm. hey, everybody uses this all throughout education, right? Therefore, it's ubiquitous, right? So the other weird thing is it's not really, uh, it's hard to know how reliable or valid it is for assessment. Because different people come up with different answers for whether something is one thing or another. But the brief overview of this taxonomy is you have knowledge, which we defined as being rote knowledge in the articles you mentioned, the one we co-authored with Reed and with Simister and Worth, right? So you have rote knowledge, which is, you know, I can memorize that and kind of say it word for word back to you, probably 15 words or less right? Mm -hmm. Comprehension is when you can reword it. In other words, you can put it in your own words. That's my dry sense of humor. I like what you did there. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. And then application is either being able to come up with an original example or when you're provided with an original example or scenario, you're able to pull out what the the principles, processes, or concepts are in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Could you give an original example, positive reinforcement? Or if I give you a scenario, can you tell me what principle is operating in there, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Analysis is when you can make a compare and contrast. So you're specifically stating how things are similar and how they're different. So tell me how positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement are similar and how they're different. And Mm -hmm. I might even go further and say in terms of, you know, their antecedents, the behaviors and the consequences. And, and, or you might, that question where you have to like state why something is an example on the basis of the principle or the definition or the concept, right? Synthesis is like a kind of more complex application, you know? So a nice synthesis question might be, tell me how you would use different operant procedures to teach somebody how to drive a a car using a stick shift. So that will require that you put together a variety of different things into a unique combination. Another way that we looked at synthesis was being able to actually take a look at a bunch of different scenarios or things and be able to create a taxonomy. So that's another type of synthesis, right? So Bloom, you know, did a synthesis. So did Darwin. Right. Like those are right. <laughs> ways in which you're creating a taxonomy of 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 things or concepts. And then the evaluation one is thought to in, involve all of those previous ones and being able to 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 actually create or and or defend an argument. Mm-hmm. So you can weigh the evidence, you can weigh like the you know, the analysis and the synthesis and come up with your own justification and argumentation. So those are the six main things. And the way we thought about it was the knowledge and comprehension is kind of, you know, the, the, the basis or, or, or the foundation. And then those other four, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation, it turns out they're not really linear, right? right. Like somebody could do an analysis, but they might are struggling with application or anything. So you might think of those other four as being higher order. But they may exist somewhat in parallel with each other, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Although you would hope that evaluation would be up higher. And to be fair, I've never thought about it that way. My mind is blown. How How did did you you think think about about it? it? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Honestly, I don't think I have. (laughs) That's okay. It's not, though, right? Because I'm a professor. Well, I mean, you probably have in some way, Jackie. Yeah. But you may just not have used the this terminology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. To right. apply to what you've been doing, right? Because, like, when you and I write study guide questions, right, you write a few that are simple. You're like, well, just define this thing for me, right? But they can't all be like that. You got to have some where there's a lot more complexity to the answer that you need. So you might have some that you compare and contrast. You might have some where I'm feeling better you ask now. them to apply it in an example, right? Or come right. up with their own opinion piece on why they might do something based on what they know. Like we're using all those varied levels. And mm-hmm. you, I mean, you probably do what I do, Jackie. You start easy and then you move harder. Yes. Like through the process. So you're using this, but you may just not have applied these particular terms to it. Thanks, yeah. Diana. But now you probably will. I think that's, you're absolutely right, Diana. I think that yeah, that's, 
that's it. And, you know, also, Jackie, another thing that came up early on in this when we were presenting this at various conferences and working in the lab with people, I remember two specific comments people made, right? So one was made by relatively famous behavior analysts who kind of got up and he said, oh, I don't see how, well, no, actually three comments I'm going to say. One was by by that person saying, I don't see how you can expect undergraduates to do this when I know some professors who can't. It's like, zing, that was weird, right? And <laughs> Throw your colleagues under the bus there, geez. I know, right? I was like, okay, I'm just like not going to touch that one. And and I'm not ever going to work in your department either. So anyway, you know, then, then another person at I think the same conference who was actually a high school teacher, she was at a behavior analysis conference, said, I don't know why you have to teach students this. In university or college, we teach it to them in grade six. And of course, Mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Perry and I looked at each other and we're we're saying, well, that's kind of interesting because it seems like they do need to relearn it. And then another person in our lab would say, you know, I think it was Toby Martin, actually, who's at the University of Manitoba now. Yes, in fact, I'm sure it was him. He said, you know, the one problem that I have with this is, aren't there some questions that are comprehension questions that are more difficult than some of the application or analysis questions? And, and mm. we said, yeah, there probably are, but we weren't ready to deal with that yet. But mm. that's what later led to me looking at complexity. Mm. Mm. Okay. Because, because it was a problem, you know, when we, came, when, when we did this work with Cynthia Reed and Heather Simister and Kirsten Wirth, who were students in our lab, and we got those two publications, we were looking at the questions and we were looking at the answers. We had a pretty good flow chart, a pretty good algorithm by, to use to score. And, and, and we would get good reliability at the lower levels. But once we got up to, you know, synthesis and evaluation, it was difficult because sometimes there were, you know, different scoring. And part of that was there weren't a lot of exemplars, right? You don't have as many of those really integrative, difficult questions as you do some of the lower order ones, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got to tell you that those three points like sort of nagged at me for mm-hmm. a long time until like I found, you know, my my way into looking at complexity and then thinking about how blooms actually intersects with com- complexity and and that sort of for me that's like the aha for how it is that you have to learn it in grade 6 and you have to learn it in grade 7 and you have to learn it in grade 9 and you have to keep relearning it every time you move up because what you're learning is different right it's not a matter of like you do all the knowledge from grade one to two and, and, and then you do comprehension in grade three to four. It's for each skill, for each level of skill, you're going to either add more or you're going to just have to re- go through that taxonomy again because it's, a, it's, it's something new that you're going to need to learn all the, the base and then the, com- the complex higher order thinking. That's exactly right, Rob. So, you know, if you think of math as a really easy one to think about, right, because, all right, so first we're counting. We, we, we have some knowledge of how to count. We can comprehend how to count. And then we start applying and analyzing that and synthesizing it and evaluating it, right? And as we're doing that, we're also learning some higher order math skills. So we go from counting to addition and subtraction. And as we're really cooking with gas with that, right, we're also starting then to go on to some things like maybe multiplication and division. Now, that doesn't happen in one week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it takes a long time, but like if you think about it, then you went on. What did you go on? What did you go on to after multiplication and division? Fractions. Yeah, fractions. Yeah, and Diana. Decimal. Yeah, <laughs> and then proportions yeah. and percentages. Mm-hmm. <gasps> right, and then you know maybe algebra, geometry. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. but sometimes if you're still struggling with the knowledge and comprehension pieces with those lower levels, doing the higher level stuff is almost impossible until you master the lower level stuff. It's true. Yeah. I remember learning how to do logic proofs Mm. and you get to draw the little, the three little dots that meant therefore. And that was my favorite thing. Fun fact. Nobody needs to know how to do proofs. They're the worst. Oh yeah. Rob really hated that stuff. I'm like so excited right now to talk about math. I know. So do you mean like truth tables? Like if, then, and therefore. Yeah. 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 All those. Yeah. We I'm going to tell you, that was like the best thing I ever learned in philosophy. Yeah. I it, love that stuff. I, I didn't think I was going to learn. I like it. I'm going to, I'm not going to lie. When I took intro to philosophy, I, I sat in the class. I was like, wait a minute. 
this is like a math class. Like, what's going on here? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I started applying it to like, you know, I was taking these research methods classes in psychology and having to write papers. And I realized, hey, if you use these truth tables, you can argue four different like lines of reasoning about an if then. Yeah. And and yep. and it turned out professors loved that. So I discovered the secret to writing papers that would get me an A. Nice. Yeah. Nice and I was like, it can't be this easy. It can't be this easy. <laughs> this is just a trick, right? Like, you know. <laughs> and when it wasn't easy, you had to do it. You had to do it. Yeah. I don't mean to say it's yeah. easy at all. But, you know, it was like when I put that together, I was so excited. I once had a teacher tell me, if you don't know how to start like a thesis argument, add the word, put the word although at the beginning of your sentence. And it will like lead you right into making an argument. Can you give us an example of how that works? I love it. Although one might think the truth tables are only applicable to philosophy class, one might actually be able to find a variety of uses for them. Oh, wow. that is good. Oh, like my jaw yeah. just dropped when you did that. Yeah, right? It's really helpful. So I tell all my students that. Because sometimes you just can't find a way into an argument. Mm-hmm. But then I'll, although allows you to do it. Wow. Although well, you might not think you can make an list. argument. Yeah. You know, Diana just showed us how you can. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My other favorite thing that ever happened in school was we had a giant piece of craft paper and we drew a Google. This was way back. Oh, the number. Yeah. Not the search engine. No. Before there was a search engine, we drew a Google, which is a one with a hundred zeros after it. I did not know what it was. So thank you for that. Yeah. I didn't know that either. Third Consider an application because you actually have to write the number out or would that just be oh, uh, you know, what you knowledge mean. because you just, you know, it's it a hundred zeros. So there you go. Right. It, it was out. just hands on learning okay. for knowledge. Yeah. Wow. Or was the, the teacher was too hungover to think of a better activity and was like, yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. Google, everybody. I still remember it. So it must have been pretty darn good. Okay. That's neat. So Darlene, you and your professor are looking at Bloom's taxonomy. You know, we'll talk about some of the <laughs> challenges that come into definitions, but were you sort of thinking at the time, okay, we've got the computer assisted PSI. We've got a framework of how to go from sort of the basic knowledge to the more advanced knowledge to ensure higher order thinking. Like that's it. That's our chocolate peanut butter. We could put this in a box. We've got the best way to learn in, in, the, in the world, or, or was it more just sort of something you were interested in, but you weren't really sure where that you know, research was going to lead you? Well, that's a really good question. I like the peanut butter chocolate combination, though. I think when we were contemplating this research, we thought about you know, all these study questions and how to help students understand how to learn better. And so... You know, I'm going to say that there, when I started doing this research, it was for my dissertation. Mm-hmm. And so coming up with good, reliable, and valid measures was part of that. And then actually communicating to students what the levels were for each of the study questions in the materials. That was another piece of it. So to actually mm-hmm. be very intentional, that's that word they like to use in education, right? Being very mm-hmm. intentional about making clear to them that this is a comprehension level question. And this is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and so if it was like an application analysis, synthesis, or evaluation question, then the students should be cued into the fact that they won't be able to just get the answer out of the textbook. Mm-hmm. They have to do something with the material, right? And they have to think about it and they have to come up with an answer that they're not going to find just by looking in the textbook, right? And then, so for my dissertation, I actually ended up doing a combination of giving guided feedback and bonus points to students in these online courses. So they could get bonus points on the midterms and the finals if they went above the level at which the question was answered. So if it was like a comprehension question and they actually gave an original example, they'd get bonus points. Mm -hmm. You know, and similarly, you know, we had it sort of linear then, right? So if it was an application question, they could do an analysis with it, they would get bonus points and so forth. So we were sort of pretending it was linear at that point. And so the the feedback during the semester was very intentionally towards saying, hey, this is a great answer. You know, remember on an exam, if you were to give an original answer to this question, like an original example instead of the one that you gave, and it's correct, you could get bonus points, right? So what was interesting Mm -hmm. about that was we started seeing all of the student peer reviewers in the program start to do that too, (laughs) 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 right? So everybody's given this awesome feedback. And in fact, 
you know, the students on average, I think like the, the, the average score when we did the, the pure scoring of the exams, it was like 18 points higher on the final for that class than for the previous semester. Wow. Ooh, yeah. There you go. It was. It was amazing. And what, what was really nice, you know, my dissertation committee was like, well, what if there's just something different about your students? Like maybe they were smarter to begin with. Right. And so I had hmm. to go back and, and look at things like what percentage or what proportion of students in, in both sets of classes were like sophomores, juniors, or seniors, or in the Canadian system, second year, third year, and fourth year. Right. And then how many of them were like arts and science and how many of them were honors students versus like four-year non-honor students. And it turned out there really weren't any differences in those demographics. And in fact, this, the, 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 the sections that did better started out doing the same or even lower than the control sections. And the other piece of that, you know, back to your question about like the system and using the system, I think one really important article that I had read was by Reboy and Sem. Reboy and Sam, pardon me, they had written this article back in, oh gosh, I can't remember what year it is. I'm going to find out for you. But it's PSI and critical thinking, compatibility or irreconcilable differences. And this was an article that they had published back in 1991 in Teaching of Psychology. And it was this, this whole article that was, you know, written in this to address this criticism that PSI could only be used and behavioral approaches to education could only be used for lower level thinking, Mm -hmm. for training robotic students, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, those of us who do this stuff know that that's not true. Yeah, But they pointed out that there's a system, but what you have in the system determines what comes out of it. Mm-hmm. So it's the, the content and the requirement, the response requirement that you have on the part of the students that will determine, you know, the PSI, as they put it, it, was an instructional delivery system. So it doesn't tell you what the course content should be. It's like mm-hmm. Canvas, right? Or Blackboard. It's a learning management system. But it's yeah. what you put into it and what you require out of your students. And when you implement that correctly, in fact, PSI and, and anything that's mastery-based produces higher levels of achievement, right, than mm-hmm. traditional lecture discussion format. So anything that has a contingency in it, in, in you know, managing the course shows improvement in higher-order cognitive skills, and that's, like, what mm-hmm. the research shows. So I think that's sort of what we were coming at from, at it from, really. Like, okay. how can we really you know, demonstrate that students do really well with this and like we're really telling them what these different levels are and helping them understand like how do I interact with this? Like I how did you guys learn how to learn out of your textbooks? Was that easy? Or what did you have to learn how to come up with good study questions or interact with your textbooks? Ms. Darlene, are you asking in terms of, you know, Jackie and Diana as professors or me as a non-professor, just someone who had to learn things? Yeah, any or all of you. I mean, in terms of my own learning, you know, I'm not a professor, but I, you know, I still have to do trainings and, you know, work with RBTs or, or work with BCBA supervisees. So individuals who I still need to provide some amount of, you know, teaching, even though it's not necessarily like you would get in a graduate or even undergraduate class. And I don't think, sometimes I I look back at how I learned things when I was young, and maybe I'm selling myself short, but I don't think I actually learned beyond an application level until I sort of had to Mm -hmm. as part of work. You know, I knew I had to do more or I had different contingencies in place. So they weren't the contingencies of I need to get an A, it was the contingencies of I need to actually help this person engage with a skill or I need to demonstrate what to do to help someone learn how to uh, you know complete a task at a job when I really started having to put more emphasis on analyzing the examples I had, synthesizing those examples. You know, and, and again, maybe I'm selling myself short, but I, I think so much of education, especially for those of us who grew up before, you know, the you know the, the really intensity of the computerized revolution was you have to learn these facts because otherwise you'll have to find a set of encyclopedias to answer the questions. And now you don't you know, you don't need to know knowledge of very much of anything because the answers are all in your pocket at all times. So that was sort of my thought process. And, and I, I wish I'd done more with synthesis and evaluation at an earlier age. I mean, perhaps I did, but it, it did seem to be something I didn't have to pay attention to until grades were not the metric by which I judged my learning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I know that I've gotten better over the years. So I think I've been learning how to work with my textbook and not use the default questions that they give you, right? Because sometimes those are fine, but they don't really provoke anything more than, you know, what the textbook offers you. There's no synthesis in what you're doing on other parts of your class, I guess. Right. Like, what do you want them to be able to do Right. by the end of the semester, right? You know, I've been teaching, I'm in my sixth year now, and I think I've only started doing that in the last, like, two years. Interesting. That's neat. That's neat when you get there, right? Oh, now I have to redo all of my classes. <laughs> but it's exciting to do, But right? But it's still a lot of work. For me as a child learner, I was always just very curious. I was like a model type of teacher's pet student. I always wanted to learn everything there was to learn. And, I, and it was surprising to me that that's not how everyone learned. So for me, it's been trying to like recreate what is interesting to me about learning and how can I hopefully instill that in others. And I have to give a major props to Dr. Greg Hanley for his college teaching course, which Jackie and I took in the WINU program. Oh, and it was entirely constructed around backwards design and how we should be prepping our courses from finish all the way back to start so that everything is pointed toward what the end goal and learning outcomes of the class should be. Mm -hmm. And I had never thought about things in that way before, but that's definitely informed how I create my classes. And when you're never sure, like, what am I doing here? (laughs) Why am I assigning this? What are we really doing? Like, that's what you need to be tying everything back into is what what do I want these students to take away from this? Mm And, and what I want them to take away has, you know, grown and morphed over time as I've become more sure of myself as an instructor and an educator for them. And I've, I think, been able to infuse more of who I want them to hopefully become through their own, you know, sort of journey to be a behavior analyst versus just what they need to learn to pass the test. And we're sort of growing together in that regard. I think that's a really good set of points, right? Like, you know, if you think about it for behavior analysts out in the field, you know, they start with an end goal, right? Like what's my, what's the target behavior or the target performance, right? Yeah. For, for this student or this client with whom I'm working. And, you know, that's what you're doing with a course. You know, what's the target yeah. that of what's the minimum that students need to be able to do to pass this course? Like by the time they get to the end, what they, should they be able to do and say? You know, and how am I going to evaluate that? So that that is a very behavioral question, right? Like because it's mm-hmm. written work or or you know, if if you're talking about training RBTs, you're looking at, you know, whatever performance they're going to do, some sort of academic performance during the educational training and then performance actually either, you know, through role playing or in, on a site to be able to qualify to take the RBT test. Or, you know, as you say, with the BACB and, and becoming a BCBA, you can't just go in there and have memorized a bunch of answers. You have to be able right. to coordinate, you know, the seven dimensions in behavior analysis, legal, ethical, and professional issues, and be able to think about those things very holistically and in a very integrative way whenever you're considering any scenario that might be thrown your way. Well, why don't we take a quick break? And then when we come back, let's talk about a little bit more of a deep dive into developing these questions, maybe looking at that fabulous flow chart you have in one of your articles, Darlene. Sure. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with more discussion of higher order thinking in higher education. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. 
Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu, regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there! And we are back talking with Dr. Darlene Crone Todd about higher order thinking in higher education. But before we get back to our topic, I wanted to remind all our listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. And by listening to this episode, you are able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is listen to the episode, of course, and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs. That's G E T hyphen C E U S and put in two secret code words. And we have two secret code words that came directly from Dr. Crone Todd. And the first one is Picard, P I C A R D. This fall on CBS All Access, join Jean Looper. I'm not going to do an ad for that. They're not paying us. <laughs> I don't know. Did you see that show, Darlene? Did you see the Picard show, the new one? Of course. <laughs> oh, was it any, <laughs> was it any good? I heard those things. I, I don't have the all access streaming, so I did not. I did not get it. I think we had it as a gift from somebody, actually. So we oh, did okay. actually we did actually watch the show. Yes. Thumbs up, thumbs down. I think what it's do you, what good. Do you think? I mean, you know, but you always have to remember that when you're doing a different show, that's not mm-hmm. the original. Then you have to expect it to have differences. But we did. We did enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I know we, we got one of those Oculus Quest VR sets. And if you if you go too far to the side and you're going to crash into something, it puts up these grids. And it reminds me that I'm on, you know, the holodeck of the Enterprise. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, how did I get here? That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> if only we had the holodeck, that would be fun. At the time of COVID, wouldn't that be the best? To have them, oh yeah, on our on our starship. I want. I just want the thing that makes the. We were talking about teas for a few minutes off mic, and you know, I want the tea Earl Grey hot machine. You know, to just make me a tea. <laughs> and by the way, you know that Earl Grey was one of Skinner's favorite teas. I did wow. not know that. Mm-hmm. Is that in a book or something? No, or you I heard no, that from... actually, his daughter Julie Vargas did tell me that because I really like <laughs> Earl Grey tea, and I I bought some one day at a before going to a board meeting, I believe, at the mm-hmm. at at the foundation and. She happened to mention that that was her one of her father's favorite teas that he would usually have in the evening. Oh, okay, it's good. Yes. And it makes you feel so sophisticated. <laughs> I know. But the, the flavor is bergamot. It is. as oil of bergamot. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And in fact, there sometimes you can buy it with the extra oil of bergamot. Oh. That's like magnitude wow. of reinforcement right there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and just, you know, for, for, for the educational content, let's just remember that that several of us, including Andy Bondi and John Ashleman and Rick Cabina, that the four of us did do a symposium on behavior analysis of Star Trek at ABAI. That's for another day. Oh, my. What year was that? I did not hear of this Wasn't talk. that long ago. I believe it was 2014. Oh, man. I never get to go to ABA. I always have to watch our kids. And Diana gets to go flying off around the, the country to go to ABA and present or do whatever fancy thing she's doing. So no, no Star Trek. Oh, we'll, have to, we'll have to do a special episode on, on Star Trek. We're going to have to Trek. revisit that. That sounds, that sounds like a bonus <laughs> I'll do episode, a darling. One. You there you go. go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What were we talking about? Oh, Picard was the code word. <laughs> the longest code word tangent. <laughs> Before we took our break, we were talking about how, sort of how we developed some of our own ideas of, of higher order thinking. And, you know, one of the things that I was really struck by in reading these articles was once you get past the issues of say, okay, let's get an operational definition that is reliable. How are we going to use some of this this uh, taxonomy in our personalized system of instruction? It really does feel like you have the magic key to design classwork that every test or every assessment or assignment is going to be like you know min maxing. So you're just maximizing like, every moment to provide all the levels of the taxonomy in instruction. And you put together a really fabulous flowchart in one of the papers. Crone Todd, Pear, and yeah. Reed. So that's one we did with Cynthia Reed, where at this point, the process that we developed, by the way, is intergroup rel- reliability for these, for both mm-hmm. articles. So we said, okay, we're going to have, and, and here's how it worked in both cases. We would take a set of questions, you know, from one unit. And we would all go off into our corners. It feels like we're in a wrestling ring or something, right? But we would all go off into our corners and we would score using the current definitions that we had. And then we would come back and in groups of two, we would meet to argue and debate our scoring 
and come to agreement. And then we would score both like those pairs. But then as those two groups, then we would get the intergroup reliability between the two groups. So it's like you take four people, everybody independently scores. Then you get group A and group B of person one and two and person three and four, respectively, to come to agreement within their groups. And then you see how much agreement there is between the groups. So as we did this, you know, we had our Nerf bats out, right? Because we didn't want anybody to get hurt. But we were sort of saying, all right, so why is it we think it's this or why is it we think it's that based upon the definitions? And then that allowed us to actually refine our descriptions or definitions of each of these. So we got down to what you see in the flow chart, right? And Mm -hmm. so then these became sort of, you know, when you start, is the keyword or phrase from the question in the text? So can you find that in the text? And if yes, is the answer clearly stated in the text? And if no, you know, then you say, is there a correct answer, right? And if yes, and they say, does it involve describing or identifying part or whole of an original example? If the answer is no, but it requires an explanation of a definition process or any other component, then that would be analysis. But if it's yes, Mm -hmm. it'd be, you know, do you have to explain how it fits the definition concept or process? If no, it might be just application, but if yes, then you're at analysis. So you can see how for every single one of these questions in the flowchart, this leads you on an investigation of what it is that you have to do or what it is Mm -hmm. that the student has to do. And one of the things that I learned from working with Dr. Pear on this is when you're assessing the level at which you're asking a question, you should always give the student the benefit of the doubt. So what is the lowest level at which this question can be answered, right? So Mm -hmm. if you say, all right, you know, like if I say to the three of you, define positive reinforcement and give an example, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look, if you asked each one of us to do that, and if we asked like, you know, a freshman or a sophomore and a master's level student and a doctoral level student, do you think we might get different types of answers? Well, sure. Right. And some of them would be like, really like, oh, wow, like you could write almost a dissertation on this, right? Mm -hmm. But the minimum level at which that could be answered, if the answer is in the textbook, is probably knowledge or comprehension. So you have to think, what is being presented to the students in the media? And by media, I mean the textbook or the online resources or, you know, TEDx, the film you're having them watch or whatever, right? Article you're having them read, whatever it is. And if it's in there and it can be answered right from there, depending on its length, it's going to be knowledge or comprehension. And you can see that through the flowchart. So the flowchart was really something we designed through this iterative process of doing, you know, our individual group and then intergroup reliability Mm -hmm. to come up with more valid, what we hoped would be more valid definitions or descriptions of each of these categories of Bloom's taxonomy. And I know that, that theme of kind of the individual to the group to the intergroup discussion was a part of a, a number of the the research studies that you published. Was this something that you thought of as, I, mean, I don't know if you thought about it that this way then, but you know, since then, have you thought about it as this would be sort of an ongoing iterative process that you'd be doing that you'd hope to have other colleagues and other programs doing and other universities doing to kind of just continually hone those definitions? Or were you sort of hoping that within your group, you could get those definitions and then those are the definitions and, and we're all set with our reliability and everything. Well, that's a good question. You know, and, and I didn't tell you the backstory of that, but the reason we went to that was because Dr. Pear and I first started scoring using Bloom's taxonomy. And we only had 17% agreement between our scoring. <laughs> and you were like, oh, no. <laughs> so we're like, wait a minute. So either we're not very smart at this scoring or this is not a very like reliable taxonomy. And we had hoped that it was the latter and not the former. So, mm-hmm. so we, you know, and so this is where we developed this process. And I can't remember how we came up with it, but maybe he suggested or I suggested that I'm way past remembering how that, that happened at this point. But I think mm-hmm. we hoped that it, we would come up with a more valid or reliable scoring system. And, and that that's mm-hmm. the model to use because 
you know, I think actually coming back to something that Jackie said that Diana commented on about, I think I do this, but I don't really think of it in these terms, right? Because Jackie, I think you said that, right? Like, I, I have these types of questions for my students in my class, but I don't necessarily call them that. And I don't think of it in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. And I think that kind of gets at the heart of being behavior analysts. These are like summary labels, right? These mm-hmm. are constructs. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's like saying like, okay, that was an aggressive behavior, right? right? But what yeah. do you mean by that? Are you hitting? Are you kicking? Are you spitting? Are you yelling? Like what, you know? And so what do you mean by comprehension? What do you mean by knowledge? And so, yeah. so I think in some ways, you know, we do these things, but we don't label it. So now when we're actually having to use these labels, then we have to have a really nice, clear set of operational definitions. That Our hope was the flowchart would help people do that. And, you know, mm-hmm. okay, here it is. Now try it. Does it work? Does it not work? You know, does it need modification? I don't, I don't think we ever have a panacea for something, but we can continue to tinker with it and make it better. I'd love to hear from from Jackie and Diana their thoughts on this as well as the ones you've been sharing, Darlene. But I sort of see it as, oh, well, wouldn't this be great, you know, depending on whatever level of education you're at of what is the ratio of level of the taxonomy you want to teach at? Well, here's a great way to sort of double check because so much I think of teaching at least feels like from the outside. And I'll, I'll admit probably has been on my part when I've been saying, you know, I'm doing a training on X, Y, or Z. I'm assuming I'm doing some of these things. I'm planning to do some of these skills. I'd like to have some evaluation or synthesis, but I'm not really assessing whether that's happening. I just, this reminds me of a synthesis question I think I had once before. This reminds me of an application question that I saw somewhere, or heard someone talk about. I'll throw it in here and then I'll hope for the best afterwards. And then sometimes I'm smart enough to remember, oh, I should assess that somehow. Or there's gotta be a way I can check if this is the case, but you know, so many things we have to get it done yesterday. So we sort of put it together and we hope for the best. And as long as nobody falls asleep or, or tells us they hated our class, we assume it went great and, and kind of move on from there. <laughs> Was that kind of a thought of, like, well, this is a great way to do these deep dives going forward. And then and it's certainly Jackie and Diana is that how were you looking at this? It's like, oh, I'm going to put this in my, I got to start going through my tests with this flow chart or anything like that. Well, I think there's a lot of questions that still remain, right? Because this is just trying to get at, like, how are we going to operationally define these categories of mm-hmm. questions? But like the author said, we still don't necessarily know, like, what's the ratio of categories based on if it's an undergraduate class or a graduate class or a doctoral level class. And, you know, even if we had that information, do we know that that is the ratio that's necessary to produce the type of learning that we're looking to achieve in that class? I don't know that those questions have been asked or answered fully yet. So this is like one step in a really big process. Mm. I love the flow chart though. And my favorite parts are when you get to the stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> Bad question. There's, Try two, again. there's two stop signs where like, if you go through all the questions, they're like, just start a new, start over new question. <laughs> that question oh, is that why you don't want to use the time? You're, you're worried that you're going to look at some tests and be like, Ooh, I got too many start agains on this, this test. <laughs> do, do not pass go. Not. Do not collect $200. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but that could happen, right? You could, you could have a question. You're like, I don't even know what I'm it's actually not book. asking I'm not the asking students. For a definition, it sort of just wanders off. Yeah. You get to that, you should start. Well, but you know, it is interesting <laughs> because sometimes people do. You know, when I when you read through a lot of work in education, people get very attached to words. You know, mm-hmm. so it's mm-hmm. it's an analysis question if you're asking them to compare and contrast, right? But wait a minute, the comparison and contrast is already done for them in the textbook. So then that becomes comprehension, right? right? Mm-hmm. So so it's interesting because, you know, just depending on the word doesn't mean that that's what it is. It's like, what are they actually having to do with mm-hmm. the question? And, and, and is that easily answerable from what's in there? And it's interesting because we came up with these things like with analysis, you know, if you're being asked to compare and contrast positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, we actually... Some some of us got into an argument, a little bit of an argument in the lab because somebody said, well, this person could just say, here's what positive reinforcement is and negative reinforcement Mm -hmm. is this. Or like, no, that doesn't count as analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've just given you the two different definitions, but they haven't made Mm -hmm. any specific statements about where they're similar and where they're different. But it, it turned out that some people would have accepted that or thought that that was appropriate. So, you know, results vary with 
you know, with instructors and with students, I think, into what they what they think is required for that type of question, right? I think that's important, and I've I've thought about that too. Is I think I know what I mean when I say compare, contrast, or define, or describe, right, or evaluate, but that's not necessarily going to mean the same thing to my students unless I provide them with a definition of what that is. Or the same way I'll say, write a paragraph about this. A paragraph is three to five sentences. <laughs> Sometimes I even include things like that because you'll get you'll get back paragraphs that aren't three to five sentences. Right. <laughs> How many pages does my paper have to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. But we shouldn't be operating under the assumption that our students, you know, have a bearing for what I have as my own definition for those words unless I provide it. Well, now I'm just thinking back to all the great like history exams where I felt like I wrote these like amazing paragraphs. So like, what were the reasons, you know, th- you know, synthesize the reasons for the, the Civil War or the American Revolution or something. And I wrote these like fabulous, you know, multiple point paragraphs. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. All I think I did was memorize the seven notes I wrote down in my, you know, in my notebook from the, the professor's lecture. Was I actually just, was it just a comprehension question? Because I just was copying and, you know, kind of regurgitating those factoids rather than actually synthesizing facts from a variety of historical documents or historical sources. Even not knowing, like, what does that mean, you know, in the, in the, in the grander scheme of higher order thinking, I, I think it is good to stop and think about, well, how much of what I'm asking is just comprehension and how much of it is actually requiring those higher order thinking skills, because I bet a lot of us, if they if we really looked back or found some old tests in like a, you know, a chest or something that our parents kept at their house from, you know, when we were in high school or, or, you know, undergraduate school, we might find like, oh, so many of the things I did never went beyond, you know, basic application of some of these themes. And here I am, you know, purporting to be an expert in a field, you know, I must have learned it at some point, I hope it's mm-hmm. kind of scary to think about. Yeah, imagine for some areas that might be true. So kind of thinking back to some of these these original studies, Darlene, have you kind of thought about how you would have done things differently since you did that research? Or is it is, is kind of a line that you continue to think of to this day when you're creating your classes or when you're updating your classes? Well, I do, actually, Rob. I, you know, I, I think about what's the end goal and the backwards design that Diana and Jackie also mentioned earlier, you know, and it's by the way, I like to bring in the four causes by Aristotle and teleological behaviorism, <laughs> too. Oh, very right? nice. <laughs> and, and rest in peace to Howie Racklin on that. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, I like to think about what is that end piece and coming back to that. And then I think that was so new to me. I'm not sure, like, I could say, well, if I went back and did my doctorate now, I'm not sure I, I could do it any differently because that's what I had to work with mm-hmm. at the time. Hierarchical complexity was really difficult to learn, but it made Mm -hmm. it so much easier to score and assess and understand how Bloom's taxonomy keeps, like you have to keep repeating it at each level Mm -hmm. that you go Mm -hmm. up where things get harder or more complex. So Mm -hmm. just like we talked about with the math, right? So earlier, but you could also think about the level at which you understand things. You know, mm-hmm. so when you're first learning principles, concepts, and procedures, like you said, with your history example, is a great example because you probably just are trying to memorize it. You're trying to get the words right. You're trying to, you know, show that you know this stuff. And then later you can do more with it. You mm-hmm. know, now if we went back and asked you about what were some of the things that, what were some of the factors that contributed to the outbreak of the Civil War, you know, and it, you would come up with an answer and you'd think about it. And you might not remember exactly everything that your professor or teacher said back then. Because I'm going to quote Skinner, right? I think there's this quote that education is what survives and what we've remembered has been forgotten or what we've learned has been forgotten. I think I, I forgot yes. the actual words. There we go. <laughs> I, think, I think you got that right. Yeah. But, that's, but that's like, you know, you have a way of thinking now. You know, and, and so the way mm-hmm. of thinking becomes kind of it's odd, like it's both rule governed at the time that we're learning it, like how how to process, like, you know, as Diana said, like using these truth tables, right? And using mm. this formal logic procedure is kind of this interesting kind of rule governed way we have of parsing out arguments, right? And then that's, um, those are embedded into the kinds of questions that Jackie uses that she mentioned without necessarily naming them that she's 
thinking about now. And so it's it's kind of neat because as you develop your more complex thinking skills, it's almost like you have to repeat Bloom's taxonomy at each level. It's like, you know, the sliding scale, you know, just as you're mastering one set of things, then you're already starting to understand and learn the next set. Now, when we talk about the use of a taxonomy, use of higher order thinking, whatever framework we're using to sort of try to improve the higher order thinking of the students in our care, have you ever done like a survey of colleagues or a survey of other graduate or undergraduate professors to kind of ask them about their process for doing higher order thinking work? Or is it one of those skills that, you know, just, just looking back at your own research, that it would almost be an invalid question because everyone's answer would be so poorly defined in terms of having one, you know, one true definition of higher order thinking? Hmm. Well, I've done a lot of work on assessment over the years. So Mm -hmm. in my first position, which was down in Mississippi, I actually got tapped as a student engagement champion. And Mm -hmm. then our job, the four or five of us in the university, was to help the various schools in the university with their assessment projects. So we did kind of tap into what are the areas of these this deeper thinking that people do. And then with that became two pretty well-known assessment pieces, which is Nessie and Fessy. So, but these are, these are interesting surveys. One is for faculty, the faculty the survey of student engagement, Fessy. And Nessie is the National mm-hmm. Student Survey of Engagement or something like that. And they're both operated by the same group. But it asks kind of interesting questions, like how many papers of different lengths have you written? or assigned as an instructor, Mm -hmm. right? And then how many hours a week do you expect your students to study for every credit hour they take? And then ask the students the same question, right? (laughs) And so it's Mm -hmm. really interesting because when you get the data, you know, when we got that data, we just, we just took them. I just took those into my classes and had conversations like, here's what your professors are saying. Here's what, you know, our students are saying at this institution, but here's what they say nationally. Right. So there's that piece of it of how much are you working and what what type of things do you do? So I think that that's 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 sort of an interesting piece to look at those. When I look at writing abilities, one of the things that I've worked on with a colleague, Joanna Gonzalves at Salem State University, she and I have also worked with Patrice Miller at Salem State to come up with a writing rubric that integrates the hierarchical complexity in Bloom's taxonomy into something that we can actually use to score written work on the part of students. So while we haven't done a survey necessarily, I can tell you informally that almost every professor would like to have their students critically think. (laughs) That's like a hallmark of Mm -hmm. higher ed, right? (laughs) That's fair. (laughs) I don't think you'd have me here if it wasn't. But what's interesting is to use like something to score to see how students are doing at different levels. We've actually used that rubric and scored sophomore level research methods papers that students have written up for their projects and upper level seminars and honors thesis papers and found that it maps very nicely onto them. And because of course, if you're doing an honors thesis or a master's thesis, you have a committee and a lot more feedback then that, so you know mm-hmm. the polished piece is going to be very different at the end of that than it's going to be in other types of writing that students might do but we definitely find that there are differences you know and and they map very nicely onto the sequence of where people are in the program so we've used that mm-hmm. actually you know it's kind of infused how to think about writing at different levels of of our program and informed us as to what students are doing at these levels and makes us think a little bit more deeply about that backward design and the upper level seminars and thesis project. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that exactly answers your question or if that got too tangential. I think it was right in line with with kind of the importance of the work you started back then, which is, okay, that's this, this is so interesting, but you know, what's the application going to be? How does this improve the lives of those that we are teaching? And I, I think that then answered it perfectly. Mm-hmm. And I think telling students what they are too, so they know what's expected of them. It makes it very clear and easier for them to be successful. I did have a question related to telling the students, and because you mentioned it earlier in the episode, when you were talking about sort of setting up the exams and then the students could earn extra points for moving beyond the level, 
Was that something that students learned just from having spoken with you, having been in the class, having you sort of taught them the categories of the taxonomy? Or did you have on the exam or on the test or activity, you know, section A, knowledge, section B, comprehension, so the students sort of knew what was expected of them per per question? So for the CAPSI talk courses, we actually had a manual for each course. So the mm-hmm. manual had the syllabus and how to use the program. And we actually had written a piece on what the different Bloom's taxonomy categories were and defined them. Mm-hmm. And then we had like level one, level two, like we had the numbers right next to each question in the study guide manual. And then, you know, on their unit tests, you know, I would give the feedback about, you know, whether they were correct, whether they answered it at the level or what, you know, how they could bring this to the next level. And, and then on their midterms and on the final, and that was written up in the syllabus as well. By the way, their first test was always a test on the syllabus, which I highly recommend. <laughs> always give a test yes. on the syllabus. Always. Yeah. Or like, put if you read this in your syllabus, send me an email and you get five points. Right? Oh, and nice. The actually looks at it. Nice. Yeah, no, we, we actually did like, you have to answer questions about the, about the syllabus in addition. That's smart. Yeah. And much mm-hmm. easier to do if you do that online. <laughs> and then you don't get so much in your inbox, but I do like that connection making too. I like that. And so, so that was all detailed in the syllabus and in the course manual and then in the feedback throughout the course. And of course, on, in, in addition on their midterms, you know, they did get bonus points if they went to the next level, at least, you know, above mm-hmm. where the level at which the question was asked. So the students really seemed to love that. They got very excited about it. You could see it in the feedback they were giving to each other. Don't forget, mm-hmm. you know, you can get bonus points on this. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, every time I hear about any sort of PSI work, it does sort of feel like it has some kind of proto gamification qualities to it that it just always sounds like that's the kind of learning I wanted to do. I sort of wanted to have the levels. I wanted to know where I was and, you know, what was going to be a little bit because I think most students want to do a little bit more than the bare minimum just to demonstrate like, no, I was staying awake in class. And and when it's very clear, like, here's where you are, here's where you could be, here's where you're going to get, you know, an actual direct benefit. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not surprised when you say that the students really, really got a kick out of it. And it, it really kind of seemed to, to, sp- to spur them on to tell their friends and let's keep, oh, we can come up with a better answer than that. That's, that's fabulous. I think my, in my experience out of every class, no matter what the number of students, there's probably always going to be some small number that don't get excited, no matter what the system, you know, probably like 5% of the students, you know, who, who and, mm-hmm. and that could be for a variety of reasons, right? Like maybe they Maybe they're not really well prepared or maybe they have other things going on in their life. So there are just a variety of reasons why they aren't. But yeah, by and large, I think when you set things up well and, and people can succeed, and again, we're back to kind of the seven dimensions of behavior analysis, right? Like if you can set it up so that they can access reinforcement early on and it leads to you know a better life as a result of having taken your course, then you have something pretty good going on. <laughs> So Darlene, in order kind of to wrap up, it was great to talk about sort of the origins of some of, of your you know work, your early work and your dissertation and sort of beginning to think of higher level thinking. And then I, we kind of started to go off in so many other great directions that there might be some research or maybe there'll be more research on in terms of the application. We're not going to have time to go over every single addendum there for tonight. So maybe, maybe again sometime in the future. But for now, why don't we go into our dissemination section of the show where we sort of talk about our kind of what is the gem of, of truth that is going to be true for everyone listening out there uh, who's a practitioner of behavior analysis, whether they are a professor or whether they are not. Oh, we're, we're here. Imagine it in your mind's eye. <laughs> we made it to the station, the dissemination <laughs> station. So Darlene, you know, We've talked about a lot of great ways that one could use the ideas of higher order thinking. I know a lot of kind of your work on the taxonomy and the flowchart is making me think of Dr. Turner's discussion about, you know, good BCBA supervision and really building towards problem solving and thinking of problem solving as a higher order skill. So I'm kind of want to go back to some of the tasks that I give to supervisees and go through the flowchart myself and be like, am I just giving everyone comprehension questions, you know, ad nauseum and I'm not challenging them at all. But if you could pick, you know, one like really take home point that you think would be relevant for all behavior analysts out there, regardless of whether they're going to be using it in an actual test for students 
or whether they're going to be using it in maybe just like a training or in BCBA supervision or more sort of general learning or teaching. What do you think is the biggest kind of take home point that you would point them to or that you would recommend they be thinking of after they listen to this episode? Hmm. Well, I think one is don't ever overestimate what you think you're asking and don't Hmm. ever underestimate your students or supervisees. That's a very good one. That's some good advice. (laughs) That would be the mantra, right? And Hmm. that fits right with the flow charts. So what's the lowest level at which I'm asking this question or, or this task that I've set up? And what's the highest level at which the student has done this or has shown me they can do this? Because you should do that assessment, you know, before you decide to teach something too low level or too high level. Excellent. Great. So Darlene, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. It was a real pleasure. This was not a topic that I ever had thought of in in terms of teaching or behavior analysis and then reading through your work and then talking with you tonight. It's given me so many exciting you know, more questions and more thoughts that I really want to either start putting into practice or, or look into the research. If other folks out there are interested in, in talking with you more about your work or in higher order thinking, is there a way to contact you, I suppose, or email or a website that they should go to? dcronetod at salemstate.edu. So D-C-R-O-N-E-T-O-D-D at Salem State, Salem, like Home of the Witch Trials, S-A-L-E-M, state. Mm-hmm. S-T-A-T-E dot E-D-U. Excellent. And Darlene, thank you again so much for your time tonight. Thank you so much for bringing this topic to our attention. I'm thinking, you know, being at Salem, uh, is, we, we usually, we like to go to Salem usually because we're, you know, we're here in, in Massachusetts as well. We did not get out there this year for, for reasons. And we are busy. We are a busy place usually. It has definitely been a different year. Any good tourist destinations when people can come back to Salem that you, that you like to recommend? The Witch History Museum is wonderful. I mean, really good sort Mm -hmm. of, if you're a behavior analyst, you'll like thinking about how, you know, rule governance and coercive control can influence behavior in a very bad way and lead to a lot of people doing a lot of bad things. And there's also money to be gained from it. So that, and and different, Mm -hmm. there's different theories about why the witch trials happen. So that's definitely a really good one. It takes a, a good interdisciplinary approach to it. The Peabody Essex Museum is amazing. It's a real gem in the middle of our city. And there are so I could go on and mention all kinds of wonderful independent stores and restaurants and just like the amazing, amazing activities and things that Salem has to offer. It's just, you know, this is usually a place that in the, from the spring all the way into November is just increasing excitement until we get up to th- until we get up to Halloween. If you do plan on coming at Halloween, I would say when, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, make sure that you make any arrangements at least a year or two ahead of time. <laughs> we have sometimes been known when Halloween falls on a weekend to have 100,000 people in the city. It does get very, very crazy there. I think, I think usually we'll try to go like late September, early October on a, on a normal year just to make sure we can get a parking spot if we get there first thing yeah, in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just to walk around, not even to do anything, just to be present. Exactly. In the city. Exactly. No, it's so true. So that's, I, they're, this is just an amazing city. Great vibe. I love all of New England, but I really love Salem. Big, big thank you to Dr. Darlene Crone Todd for coming on the show tonight to talk all about higher order thinking which again, I kind of, as I mentioned in the wrap up was a topic that, you know, so exciting to have a guest talk about, because had I just read Dr. Krontod's articles, I would have said, great, we've got all the answers, but getting to talk to the researcher herself and think about all that has been learned since those articles were published. Oh boy, there's so many more questions about how to best teach higher order thinking, but I think I have a couple solutions or at least partial solutions that I'm really excited to try out in my own teaching, wherever it may be. I'm not as fancy as as the doctors on the show in their graduate classes, but oh well. Oh well, maybe someday, right? Anyway, I'm excited to get to talk with all of you about these topics. And speaking of teaching in the form of at least CEs, you might want that second secret code word. And again, this is courtesy of Dr. Crone Todd. It is Skywalker. 
S K Y W A L K E R Skywalker. You know, if you remember our last code word, you know that this one, as Dr. Crontot said, is for all the fans of a different franchise. This is, you know, Skywalker like Luke or Anakin Skywalker from the fabulous film Star Wars. I'd like to say that I spent this summer, as many summers, reading a lot of professional development books, but there was something about this year where I just kind of needed a break. And so I read a lot of books about. Luke Skywalker and friends unrelated to behavior analysis, but it was a nice, a nice break from the the hustle and bustle of the rest of 2020. I know we're in 2021, but I don't think we'll stop talking about 2020 for quite some time. But anyway, that last code word Skywalker. And with that, we've come to the end of another episode of ABA Inside Track. We hope you enjoyed the show. would really love it if you would subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you like to get your podcasts. If you wouldn't mind leaving us a review as well, that's one great way that we can get some feedback as to how you feel we're doing, maybe even some topic ideas for the future. There are a lot of other ways you can get in touch with us if you don't want to leave a review, of course. Why, certainly you could go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, where we have links to all of the articles articles that were discussed in our episodes, as well as a link to purchase CEs if you are so inclined. You can also find us on social media. We're everywhere as ABA Inside Track, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. You can find these episodes all posted on our YouTube page with the YouTube subtitling activated. And of course, if you're interested in a little bit more ABA Inside Track every month, you can join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for just $5 a month, you can subscribe at our social tracker level, where you're able to join us for a bi-monthly meeting of other patrons, as well as to get access of our podcast a little bit early. And at some of our other levels, you're even able to get extra bonuses, including our book club. We have our second book club coming out next month, where we spend hours and hours talking about a specific book voted on by our patrons. And those are worth two learning credits, as well as discounts to our CE store and some other goodies. So yes, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. And of course, there's always good old fashioned email, track at gmail.com. Well, another big thanks to Dr. Crone Todd for coming on the show. Thanks to Jackie and Diana as well. We'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye.